And you know what I think people underestimate about me is I'm much more resilient than they thought. Uh, and people have underestimated me in the past. You haven't just been unpopular like other politicians. You have had thousands of people marching against you. You've had you've been burnt in effigy. I mean, how does that Don't feel? Okay, steady on it, rubbing it. But do you live every day as if it might be your last? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, everything at full pelt. The window of opportunity for UKIP to really establish itself is here now. Uh, I've got to go with it and to hell with the consequences. So the third term is uh, not something I'm contemplating. Terms are like shredded weed. Two are wonderful, three might just be too many. I mean, everybody knows we want Scotland to be an independent country. This is an opportunity for Scotland to force a different political direction and to get more progressive politics inserted right into the heart of Westminster. In eight weeks' time, Ed Miliband and his family could be walking into Downing Street. Their days of carefree strolls in the park, a thing of the past. You know, it's frustrating when I don't have enough time to see them. And obviously, I think about, you know, what would happen if I was prime minister yeah. and uh, making sure there's enough time because but my most important job is being a dad. Which is not easy when you're always on the phone. How much time does daddy spend on the phone? Too much. <laughs> too much. I think it's definitely, too definitely much. too much. He's at work, or he's on the phone, <laughs> or he's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Just round the corner, Justine Miliband, a high-flying barrister, told me in her first major television interview how they cope as working parents with two young boys. They think he leads the red team, so there's quite a lot of chats. I mean, you saw them. You saw them in the park. Um, there's quite a lot of chats about what the Reds team's doing and who the Red team's helping um, and things like that. So I hope they're getting a sense uh, that he's doing something worthwhile. Despite being a high-flying barrister, she rarely comes out to speak for her husband. But in this election, that's going to change. The only reason I first gave a speech to Labour Party members at Labour Party conference was because I was so worried that by about three years in, all they knew about me was a dress I wore to Ed's speech. And I thought, I really want to reassure people that I am, in fact, more than a dress. How do you feel when Ed is ridiculed? I think it's going to get worse. I think over the next couple of months, it's going to get really vicious, really personal. But um, I'm totally up for this fight. And um, I've thought about the reason why. And the reason is because I think this goes way beyond Ed as an individual. I think it's about whether decencies and principle count for something in political life, wherever you are on the political spectrum. And so it's not just about Ed, but it's about every single politician who tries to do the right thing. Further down yeah. that way. Yeah. Uh, but more or less, yeah. more or less, this is the route I would have taken. Fighting back is something Ed Miliband knows about. We joined him and his former teacher, Chris Dunn, at his old school Haverstock in North London, where he said he learned to stand up for himself. I mean, it toughened you up? Definitely toughened me up. I mean, there are a few sort of scraps you get into, try to sort of look after myself. You've been, you say you can hold your own. I mean, yes. what, what does that mean? Well, it means I didn't really get beaten up. You know, I sort of gave as but good as is, I get. Why is that? Is that because you, you could argue with them or would you <laughs> fight them? I was or you had a big brother? I mean, what, what, what was the sort uh, of... Maybe a combination yeah. of all of those things. Yeah. I wasn't a tearaway or a yeah. rebel. But don't you have to be a rebel to be a politician? Don't you want to have to change things? Well... Yes, you do. Um, and I, that's, that is what I want to do. At home in his kitchen, Mr Miliband told me how he and she ignore all the ridicule and poor opinion polls. And you know what? I think people underestimate about me is I'm much more resilient than they thought. Uh, and people have underestimated me in the past. And let's see what the, uh, the result of this election is. I don't really care what people throw at me, right? People have thrown a lot at me in four years. I don't really care about it. Do you not sometimes fear that they, the British public made up their mind four and a half years ago and they said, hmm, this is the bloke who looks a bit odd, who's a bit lefty, who shafted his brother, and then they stopped listening? It's not about me. In the end, it's an opportunity for the British people to make their decision about what kind of country do they want. Thus, the Miliband pitch for the election. A decent man who wants change. But as he knows only too well, winning this election won't be a walk in the park. This is Nick Clegg with Call Clegg here on LBC. And the first caller is Dave in Winchester. Hello, Dave. He won't be Deputy Prime Minister forever, nor leader of the Liberal Democrats, nor even a chat show host on the radio. Herbie yes. and Harrow, I think I recognise Herbie. But when his life in politics is over, Nick Clegg will always be a son. 
Come on, go, go. Hermance Clegg was born in the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia, and spent three years in a brutal Japanese prison camp during the war. Once in England, she did everything to give her four children the carefree childhood she never had. When my brothers and my sister and I were younger, um, she spent pretty well every holiday at my, my mother's mother. He grew up in rural Buckinghamshire, a life that was comfortable, middle class and safe. Well, almost. No, I had a very bad skiing accident, trying to show off, and um, it all went horribly wrong. <laughs> but when his politics went horribly wrong, when he broke his promise not to raise tuition fees for the students of today, he got more than a broken leg. He got abuse from all sides. How do you feel when you see your son subjected to some of those vitriolic criticism that, that almost any politician has ever had? As a mother, I feel the strains and stresses that he um, obviously the job brings. But again, he's very strong. And um, he and Miriam have a very um, lovely relationship with their children. They are dedicated parents. And we have a very um, close-knit family. So we are there to help whenever we can. Wat is zo schattig? Hij zegt niks. Has it been raining? With a Spanish wife, Dutch mother, and half-Russian father, Nick Clegg's family is as cosmopolitan and international as it is traditional and English. A unique background that shaped his politics. No, it is. You go first. Okay. Oops. Oh, oh, we spilled some. <laughs> At the pub, he told me he's not one to cry over spilt milk or even beer. You haven't just been unpopular like other politicians. You have had thousands of people marching against you. You've had, you've been burnt in effigy. I mean, how does that Don't feel? Okay, steady on it, rub it in. I mean, uh, um, <laughs> no, but how does that feel? Well, listen, I mean, if you spent all your time sort of moping around, worrying about what you know opponents or, or critics would say, you, you'd never, you'd never get a job done. In a few weeks' time, you could not just be out of office, you could also be out of Parliament. Are you really yeah, look, I, I really believe in what I'm doing, so of course I want to carry on doing it. But I'm also, so, you know, I'm 48 now, I'm also someone who kind of, I've never sort of thought that politics is the be-all and end-all. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a dad before, and a husband before I am a politician. Um, and I will be a dad and a, and a husband long, long after I've left politics. And I've, I've met some other politicians who sort of appear, appear at least to suggest that from the from the, their days in the cradle they wanted to be in politics and can't imagine leaving Westminster other than in a coffin. I'm not like that. I, you know, at the end of the day, I'll do my best and then we'll see. But will his best be enough? We're a battle-hardened, uh, toughened up, more liberal party now than we were five years ago. Or that whilst this next election is obviously a very kind of is an election of resilience for us to show that we can kind of hold on to the vast majority of the MPs we've got. I'm absolutely no sure, I'm absolutely no doubt that once we're through that, we will grow again in the future. Uh, I, saw, I saw a huge kite just down. Yeah. The question is whether Nick Clegg will be part of that future or have more time to spend with his family. What is it that makes this man tick? For 16 long years, we've watched Nigel Farage cross the channel to wage war on the EU with an enthusiasm that remains undimmed. I've always been excited about going to Europe, yeah. ever since I was a kid. But sometimes he puts politics on hold to indulge a secret, nocturnal passion. One thing I can fit in to my working life is yeah. shore fishing, because I can do it at night. So you shore fish at night? Oh, yes. Yes, so I might have had a busy day in London, yeah. uh, but I might, I might nip down to the coast and have three or four hours, sort of through to the early hours of the morning, fishing. Um, Do you ever sleep? Well, I've got a busy life. There isn't, it's a shocking waste of time anyway, isn't it, really? So. <laughs> still smoking, still breaking the rules, the UKIP leader took us on what could be one of his last trips across the Channel as an MEP ahead of an election where he's hoping to end his exclusion from Westminster. Yeah. En route, we stopped off to indulge another great passion, the battlefields of the Great War, in particular Vimy Ridge, near where his grandfather, Private Harry Farage, was injured in 1917. That's my grandfather. He's come back home after being wounded 
he's got the wound stripe on his arm, yes. which I understand meant people bought you a drink in the pub because you were a hero. His fascination, he says, is driven by a simple question. How would he have behaved? And I have faced fear. I faced fear in a plane crash once. I've got some idea of what it's like. It's not a great experience. So no, I'm fascinated, you know, bravery fascinates me. As well as that plane crash, Nigel Farage has been run over by a car and survived cancer. I, I consider myself one of the luckiest people alive. But do you live every day as if it might be your last? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, everything at full pelt. But his family, he admits, has paid a price, particularly his four children. We, we, we have this very unusual surname. There aren't many of us, um, and that is difficult. Um, it's difficult when you're younger, because you're going to get teased mercilessly wherever you go, but it's actually difficult when you're growing up too, because people are judging you uh, unfairly by your father. Um, and that's, yeah, that's tough. Yeah. Yeah. That is tough. But, you know, but he suggests it's a price worth paying. The window of opportunity for UKIP to really establish itself is here now. Uh, I've got to go with it and to hell with the consequences. That opportunity was created in part here at the European Parliament, where his outspoken assault on Brussels generated UKIP headlines. But did his rudeness towards some Europeans here encourage racism among others in his party? There's no link yeah. between a bit of gentle teasing and extremist views. But isn't that the point? Some people look at you and they, they look at you being rude to people sometimes and they say look, there's something slightly dangerous about Nigel Farage beneath this veneer of remorseless joviality there's actually quite a dangerous guy there's a demagogue a rabble rouser. every week in the House of Commons they scream and shout at each other all I've done in here is tease people a bit I'm the one that's taken the abuse Nigel Farage hopes the next phase of his life is about to begin away from seat 20 in the European Parliament a bit lonely today beneath the bravado you might just be a little apprehensive. Go on, back and face, Chad. Saturday morning in the Cotswolds and Chadlington under nines are taking on Crowton Colts. Go on, Elwyn, get in the middle. Come on, Chad, back and face. And on the touchline... Go on, Elwyn. ...a rather enthusiastic dad. Oh, great save. But while his son's team is looking to score goals, David Cameron's hoping to win at the polls. He told me he wants to stay on for a full second half. I'm putting myself forward for the full five years. I feel fit enough and healthy enough to do the job. I've got a real passion for it. I'm really keen to win, and if I fall short, I will be very disappointed. Just a short drive away through the rolling Oxfordshire hills lies the Cameron's constituency home. Here, he's the family's chief cook. Hi, James. Brilliant. Hi. Thank Brilliant. you very much indeed. Right, shop. But for how long will he be the nation's chief minister? Most prime ministers won't speculate about their future, but in a striking admission that will shape the election campaign, he told me and the country that he had a sell-by date. Would you go for a third term? No, I think, um, you know, I'm standing for a full second term. I'm not saying uh, all prime ministers necessarily definitely go mad or even go mad at the same rate. Um, but I think, you know, I feel I've got more to bring to this job. I think the job is half done. The economy's turned around. The deficit's half down. I want to finish the job. And he kicked off what could be five years of speculation about who might take the job on from him. There definitely comes a time where fresh, you know, a fresh pair of eyes yeah. and fresh leadership would be good. And, and the Conservative Party has got some great people coming up, the Theresa Mays and the George Osborne's and the Boris Johnson's and the... You know, there's plenty of talent there. There's, uh, yeah. I'm surrounded by so, very so good no, people. So, you know, the full five years, but no the, third the term. Thir the third term is uh, not something I'm contemplating. Terms are like shredded wheat. Two are wonderful, three might just be too many. This is an astonishing thing for a Prime Minister to say just before an election. Not only starting a lengthy leadership contest, but also telling voters, back me now and see the back of me in five years. It's a big gamble. Of course, he still has to win a second term first by convincing voters that despite his privileged background, he understands their lives. How much has being posh held you back politically? Oh, the whole posh question. I, look... Well, I mean, it hasn't stopped me becoming Prime Minister. It makes it easier, though, for your opponents to say the Tories are the party of the rich, doesn't it? It probably does, because, you know, they, they quite like making attacks based on sort of mm. class and background mm. and things like that. I think that's completely out of date. I think it switches people off. I mean, I'm a sort of country boy at heart. 
For some peace away from Westminster, he returns most weekends to the place his family call home. You know, London was their home, and they're at school in London, but because we live in number 10, which is one of my children calls the pretend home, um, <laughs> uh, it's very important that they feel very rooted and grounded here. Hi. Morning, Martin. Hi. Hi. Morning, everyone. All well? Weekends are for catching up with constituents and shopping at the butchers. I like the thighs because they're very juicy. A butcher that's popular among what's become known as the Chipping Norton set of local celebrities. So is David your most famous customer? No, certainly not. There are plenty around here. Mr Clarkson, I expect, pops in from time to time, doesn't he? Great. Thanks very much. Thank Bye, Chris. Much. See you later. Cheers. And speaking of the Prime Minister's friend and neighbour, even the children are lobbying their dad. Nancy has threatened to go on hunger strike unless Jeremy Clarkson is restored. <laughs> so I, I've told her this is not necessarily a useful intervention. So it's not exactly yes. Gandhi, so we had no, a discussion yeah. about this this yes. morning. And with all this going on at home, it falls to his wife, Samantha, to try to keep him sane in the weeks ahead. He looks plenty. He looks good. He's definitely, in my mind, the best man for the job. And what's your role in, in keeping David grounded during this campaign? Oh, well, I hope that me and the family help him, me and the children help him to sort of keep thin, things in perspective, uh, keep him grounded, uh, help him to sort of pace himself over the next eight weeks. Sanity check, that's what it's about. Definitely. I hope, I hope. Mm -hmm. So, Sorry. Nancy's hunger strike this morning lasted a yeah. yeah, yeah. How is the hunger minutes. strike going? Yeah. Yeah. Like family time's precious for any Prime Minister, Between but lunch. what we know now is that if he doesn't get more time to spend with his family in a few weeks, he'll certainly get it in five years' time. This is Irvine Beach. I, mean, I grew up just a couple of miles outside of Irvine. And... Is this the most powerful woman in Britain? Nicola Sturgeon might not look like a radical, but Scotland's First Minister does want to break up the United Kingdom. Why? You know, when I grew up here, the Tories were in power, Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister. There was a, a sense of you know, almost hopelessness that a lot of people had. Faced with what you described, the Thatcher years, lots of people in Scotland turned to the Labour Party. Yeah. Why didn't you? I think even back then, it just seemed to me that Labour wasn't able to offer real protection against the Tories. And that very directly is what led me to think, well, why should we have governments that we don't vote for? Surely it would be better if Scotland was independent. Nicola Sturgeon and her family remain rooted here in the west coast of Scotland. Hiya. She has placed feminism at the heart of her politics, saying she wants her niece Harriet to grow up in a fairer society. So, why are you late? Do you think women have made much progress since the 80s? Yeah but there's still a long way to go. I mean, I, you know, I'm the first woman First Minister of, of Scotland and unlike Mrs Thatcher, uh, in a sense, I, I want the fact that I am in this position to change things for the better or help to change things for the better for other women in all walks of life. It's not always easy. This First Minister has been attacked for her policies and her appearance. One male MP even mocked her hairstyle and called her a wee lassie. I'm human, uh, you know, shock horror politician, uh, human. Of course, you know, any politician that says they don't get upset occasionally by things that even the media has not been honest. And often it's your family that get more hurt and wounded by some of these things than, than you do. Her husband, Peter, is no stranger to those pressures. He is chief executive of the SNP. At home, he does all the cooking, he says, but... So she still irons my shirts. Um, which is something that she still tries to protect as, um, you know, from, from a, a time prior to when she was First Minister. She still does, on a Sunday evening, try to get me set for the week as well. It's a domestic thing I do, and it's like, as, as long as, I, I think in my head, as long as I do that, I, I'm off the hook for anything else. Who would have thought then she would be the First Minister of Scotland? The signs were there, though. Elder sister right. Nicola was always into politics. Gillian, five years younger, wasn't. Did you get on? Well, we did to young, but when you were studying and I was playing loud music, we never put on. Nicola used to torment me quite a bit. Yes, she did. In what way? She used to, used to chase me up the stair and I used to be petrified. You put on this monster voice and run up the stairs. <laughs> Not true. She did. No, you didn't. How you doing? Yeah, nice to see you. Tell us something we don't know about you. 
Oh, hi. It's something you don't know, I'm terrified of dogs, so I'm slightly scared on this beach just now. Every time I see a big dog, I'm thinking this would be really, really embarrassing if I freeze on camera. So there you go, I'm terrified of dogs. If you were addressing the English, for whom you're being painted in some regards as a real danger, what would you say to them? Well, there's nothing to be frightened of from the SNP. I mean, everybody knows we want Scotland to be an independent country. This is an opportunity for Scotland to force a different political direction and to get more progressive politics inserted right into the heart of Westminster. How Westminster responds to the newly powerful Nicola Sturgeon could shape the future of these islands. James Cook, BBC News, Irvine.